Well, there were a number of things with respect to the petition for a special meeting, in our opinion. One was that it didn't request a specific action, didn't propose any particular action, other than to have a discussion. Um, since Guilford is a SB2 community, it's very difficult to have a discussion at the ballot box when people are voting on a question. Um, so it didn't seem like, th without a specific question, that there was any real way to hold a um, meeting as a special meeting which would have a voting authority when the purpose of the petition seemed to be simply to have a discussion and a dialogue regarding um, action that the board had taken. So, um, so that was our interpretation of that request for a um, special meeting. Uh, there are a number of cases that have been decided, um, particularly on the town side, regarding the fact that petitions for special meetings in districts and in towns are not treated in the same manner that petitions for special warrant articles or, or warrant articles are treated and that boards have discretion in making the determination as to whether or not they in fact hold that meeting. So based on those um, factors, the, the, um, it was determined that the board would, I guess, you know, there were options that were laid out. The board determined that it would have a public hearing to address the questions that were raised and satisfy the intent of the petition as best the, the board could. I think that was their, their intent, to try and satisfy that and have a dialogue. So you do acknowledge that there is a differentiation between what we're doing tonight, talking, versus what we asked that there's other legal things that could be the outcome of a petition meeting. A petition meeting would involve a second session at which there be a warrant article that was voted on. Since the petition did not warn anyone of any action that was taking place, there was no opportunity for the board to have a special But that meeting. does not conclude or draw the foregone conclusion that some specific action would not have come out of that legal special meeting. No action could come out of it. In order for the board to have a meeting and a special school district meeting, there needs to be a specific purpose that that meeting is warned for. Okay. So uh, I've, 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 given, I've given my opinion. I'm not going to get into a running dialogue and debate about That's this. the purpose of this meeting. That's what we asked for. And we asked uh, to all the questions and follow-up questions to the voter satisfaction. That's what it says here. Now, uh, you see this stutter on the point between petition warrant article and warrant article, and I would like to ask this question to Mr. Weber. You're currently working on a new school contract, is that correct? I'm sorry. You're, you're currently working on a new teacher's contract, is that correct? Uh, the, not yet. The, 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 okay. uh, the collective board. But, but when it does come up, it becomes a separate line item or separate warrant in the vote, is that correct? That's correct. So, if the voters of the time disapproved whatever the contract was, you consider that binding. Would you tell me how our petition board of Article 4 is not binding? Why the will of the people, why the voters are being ignored? Well, do you want to answer that? Well, I mean, I'll give you my two cents. The, the Article 4, um, we have Article 4 here. Uh, right, right, and it, and it, and it talks uh, that um, uh, Essentially, my I'm question just, is, uh, hold on a I'm just trying to find the, the exact word. Okay, provisions, it says that um, the Article 5, 1998 School District Board read uh, that the school, Gil, Guilford School District vote to accept the provisions of RSA 194C providing for the withdrawal of the Guilford School District from SAU 30 involving the school districts of Laconia and Gilmanton in accordance with provisions of the proposed district plan. Okay, the... The supporters of Article 4 have been saying that the plan that was proposed by the SAU Planning um, Committee, and that was then forwarded to the state, um, that, that that was the final plan that the school board should have uh, implemented. But if you look at the 
uh, minutes from the school district meeting in March, on March 18th, 1998, there are two statements. One statement from Mr. Chuck Clark, who was the chair of the ACU Planning Committee, and this is verbatim quote from the minutes. Mr. Clark, Clark responded that the committee's recommendations were illustrative, in own, were illustrative only and attempted to address public concerns of costs. Nothing was cast in stone and decisions concerning the qualifications of personnel would be made by the school board in accordance with state law. The next persons are then uh, a little later on, uh, the moderator rec um, recognized Carol Crony, who explained that the issue before the voters was, con was a conceptual one, which would allow the board to move forward with, mo with more definitive plans. So those are the two statements that were made just prior to the vote uh, to remove um, the Guilford School District from SAU 30. There are no statements in the minutes stating anywhere that the plan that was proposed by the SAU Planning Committee was the definitive final plan. That's why the SAU Transition Committee was established. They continued to study it and they came up with a proposal in December of 1998 uh, of the current administrative structure. So that is you know, that, 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 is, that is the main bone of contention. The supporters of Article 4 say that the SAU Planning com uh, Committee's plan was the final plan. We don't see it that way. And we don't see anything in the minutes from the school district meeting on March 18, 1998 that indicates that that plan was the final definitive plan that had to be adopted. I, I believe you misinterpreted my question. I was trying to draw a parallel between a contract and a warrant article that the voters have to approve vis-a-vis -vis pay raises and warrant article 4, and we wouldn't buy the warrant article. How can you accept one, ignore the other? You don't have the power to ignore the, the will of the people on a contract vote. Why do you have the power to avoid the will of the people? I'm talking to Mr. Weber, please. <laughs> It, it's a legal question, and, and we've got, we have legal counsel here. Please. RSA 273A, which governs the approval of collective bargaining agreements, and the Sanborn decision um, from 1990-something or other, indicate that, that in order to pay cost items of a collective bargaining agreement, it requires the approval of the legislative body. That's an area that has been delegated to the legislative body to make a determination on. So, you're correct. In order to pay the cost items of a collective bargaining agreement, voters need to be warned of the cost of that, those cost items of that collective bargaining agreement, and they need to vote to approve those cost items before those cost items are paid. And that's been determined both by the language of RSA 273A, which governs collective bargaining, and by a number of court cases that have interpreted the application of that statute. And that's distinct from this area. If, if, okay. you, if you got a quick follow-up, no, that's no, no, okay. No, but I, I, I've got several more questions. If my time's up, I'll... Yes, please. Anything. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, moderator, Mr. Chairman, uh, my name is Scott Craycraft. I live at 271 Bell Mount Mountain Road. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is to the gentleman who accused me of calling him a liar, I was responding to the fact that he was implying that the leading member of the board was a liar and that he should not do that. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed at this meeting tonight is we have an attorney uh, who seems to be a very good attorney uh, who has tried to explain this fairly in terms of statutory and case law, and we have a lot of people in this room uh, that seem to want to practice law without a license. Um, uh, you know, I think that's kind of bad. The, uh, second, uh, the third thing is I think we have a very good moderator here, but as a point of order, we had a gentleman who looks like he's about to speak again, who has accused members of our board of serious crimes, of embezzlement, and so forth. Those are criminal charges. I would, hope that, the moder I, I would hope that the moderator uh, would not allow that kind of invective in a meeting like this because it is uh, outright slander. As far as the, uh, the superintendent, I don't have children in school. I've never had children in the Guilford School, but I've always been glad to pay my fair share of taxes because I think education affects all of us, whether we have kids in school or not. Um, the uh, law is clear. 
It's not direct democracy. We elect a school board and we delegate those decisions to them, just like we elect members of the legislature and we delegate those decisions to them and to members of Congress. A school board should not be, have to be second-guessed by a mob every time that it makes a decision in the best interest of the school, a decision that is in accord with state law, with State Department of uh, Education regulation, and case law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I'm telling you, that the man that just Hi, my name is Kathy Deffinger, and I, am, I live in the town of Guilford. I have two children and in the school like system. To file a lawsuit against me. Mr. Hopkins, would you please sit down? Mr. Hopkins, please sit down. In my lawsuit. Officer, would you have now this gentleman find his seat? I'm going to turn distributed. Joe, Joe, you're being very rude to this young lady. You're being very rude to this young lady. Let her speak, please. Joe. Um, I just wanted to say, actually. Okay, thank As you. I was saying, I have two kids in the school system, actually one just graduated. It's an incredible school system, actually. And I have a little bit of experience with different school systems as I grew up in a military family, so I moved around quite a lot. Um, and I'm happy to say that we, my kids have gone through the whole school system. My daughter's almost finished, but I came to this meeting tonight thinking the people that were um, against us having a superintendent and felt that we could somehow have this great school system without a superintendent, we're going to explain how that would work. Um, and early on in the meeting, we were told that it, it's really a moot point because it's not, it's a law that we have to have a superintendent, which is, brings me great joy that that is the law. So my question is, if the discussion is only about debating this law or about discussing how, um, what deliberative sessions mean or what this vote means, th that's very different than what this meeting was supposed to be, in my opinion. So I, I just want to know, um, we could be here all night if the discussion is going to be whether it's a law or not. Or not. Um, anyway, just want to say, and, and I think it's, I'm happy that we have a, a, such a great school system, and I think it's um, necessary that you have someone in charge. I also think if you're going to start looking at other school systems and what they pay, you have to look at their whole structure. They might have many administrative assistants underneath that superintendent. So I think you can't take one part of the school system and start comparing it. Thank you. Hi, Terry Stewart, Cross Lane, Guilford, New Hampshire. Um, I just want to, I actually uh, spoke on behalf of the original Article 4 as it was presented at the deliberative session. I wanted to clear up just a couple of things before I get to my larger point because I'd like to speak <coughs> on the point that the young lady just made. Um, I find it interesting that there's been some discussion about the article as it was submitted on the ballot, because it was written exactly the same way as it was in 1998, which, which happened to serve the purposes fine by all the voters present at the time to separate from SAU that we were a part of. So there's nothing wrong with the way it was written. Um, I will speak, uh, uh, it's a little interesting that we pay an attorney to serve all of us, and I have to say I was a little disappointed in an answer that you gave an earlier person, which obviously leads to the confusion of the young lady that was just here, because I'm going to make Mr. Chairman Weber's day. I agree that it is totally up to the board to run this district. That's the law, and I agree with that. I know that may be a shock to some people that are hearing me say it, but there's no way this body is going to get around that. You make the decisions. But what is glowingly absent and misleading, I might add, Mr. Legal Advisor, 
that it is also not illegal to not have a superintendent. And you answered the question by saying, it, when, the, when it was asked earlier, that that's not the position of the New Hampshire State Board of Education. That's not true. I called them. I asked them. The purpose of 194C lays out the plan to show that you can do it without a superintendent. Whether the school board chooses to or not, that's their decision. I agree with that. But at least let's have an honest dialogue here. My concern here is when this was laid out as the district plan, there was a talk, there was discussion, and you pointed out by Mr. Clark, that Mr. Clark at the time, leading up to the vote, said <clears throat> that the plan was conceptual in nature. You've pointed to that. And I read on and I've talked to other people on both sides of this issue. And the way I see it is that you, the board, have the ability to run this district any way you wish, with or without a superintendent. Paul, you alluded earlier that you're really kind of following the plan, but you're calling the district manager, uh, as proposed, the business manager, a superintendent. Is that correct? No, School the it's not a business manager that the plan called for. I believe the, the okay. plan called for school administrator. Okay. So you're saying you're kind of following the plan, but you're calling the school administrator a superintendent. At the deliberative session, legal counsel at the time said the same thing. They said that the plan doesn't say that we can't have a superintendent. Okay, I agree with that. The problem is that I'm holding in the, in the plan what was, what was the organizational chart of the district. It's your traditional top to bottom staff underneath, and then it has a proposed, clearly, by anybody that's taken one day of management class, eighth grade even, that this is not the model that you're, you're doing right now. It's your choice, but let's have an honest dialogue. You have not streamlined the administration here. I would argue that you've actually grown it. You have an SAU building, we even voted for it. But now you're putting all the staff members and uh, the superintendent, we have an assistant superintendent, so I kind of summarize by saying, um, you know, as Mr. Dormandy remind me, I've had discussions with him on this, that the, this plan was written a long time ago, 13 years, and a lot has changed. We have less students, we have a different economy, we have different ways to manage things that we didn't know about just from, just from learning, from what big CEOs do. You're, what you're telling us is that this tiny district needs a, per, a, a superintendent, an assistant superintendent for business, three principals, two assistants, four staff level department heads at last count, maybe five, I get confused as to some of them, a full complement of secretaries. This district needs all of that. So I've been reminded that this school is not a business. And that would be true, however in this case we're talking about the business end of running schools. I've also been reminded that good practice, any good, any good business, it was said the last time this debate came up, requires a CEO. We need, we need a top figure. Well, I would submit that the, that the structure you currently have right now for the size of this business, if it was any other business in the, on the planet, somebody, that, that CEO would lose their job pretty soon. That's all I'm saying. The purpose of putting Article 4 on the ballot, as far as I was concerned, and I delivered it, I believe, just kind of started the dialogue with Dr. Domenico at one time, was because I thought at that time we didn't, we were losing a superintendent, I have no issues with the job he's done. I thought it was a good time to at least at a bare minimum, consider your resources, look at the capacity, look at the needs, and then determine what you needed and how to go about doing it before jumping into the fire and hiring a superintendent. Wasn't done. Wasn't considered. In every case, the school board has denied even wanted. That wasn't our model. That's not what we decided to do. I just suggested that you look at it. It should have been done. Any responsible group would have done that. You have 30 seconds. And a day before the vote was a little suspicious. So that's my two cents worth. I strongly recommend that you take a strong look in the next two years before redoing a contract 
to see how many bodies are needed to administer this district. And if this is what it takes, I'd be surprised, but at least you'd have a ground to stand on. Thank you. I'm holding here. This gentleman's been waiting, and then we'll go to the lady. Uh, good evening. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to uh, stand up and speak. Uh, my name is Carl Gebhardt. I, uh, I live on Doris Drive here in Gilbert. Uh, Lorraine and I were transferred here in 1980. Uh, two sons went to Gilbert High School, college, graduate school. They're doing well, and we have this school system uh, to be thankful for, and, and we appreciate it. You know, I'd like to believe, after hearing all of us talk, the main reason we're here is to help and support the school board to give us the best education we can for every dollar of our, our taxes. We want the best bang for the dollar in terms of giving our kids an edu a good education. Uh, we're doing a pretty good job of that. Whether we do it with a school superintendent or through an administrator person, I'm going to trust you people to make the right decision to come up with the right management um, group to accomplish that. You know, from what I've read about the superintendent person to the administrator person, is if we go to an administrative-led, administrative officer-led organization, some of those current duties of the superintendent might be passed on to uh, maybe the town of Guilford, or perhaps the principals of the various um, schools here in Guilford. You know, all those people, the town, the principal, they've got their hands full right now. Are we going to give them additional duties that might result from having an administrative officer-led organization versus the school superintendent? Do we really want to add additional people to some of those organizations to handle that workload? Do we really think that those organizations have enough people in time that they can handle additional workloads? I don't know. But again, I, um, I'm trusting that we've looked into this. Uh, we've made what I hope is the right decision. And um, I'm going to do the best I can to support you, make it work. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I'm Betsy Kelly, 17 Linda Lane. Sorry, Would you say your name again, please? Betsy Kelly. I have been a resident and taxpayer of Guilford for 31 years. Three children have gone through the school district and in my opinion all received an excellent education and now are successful in their chosen careers. And I want to thank the school board, the present school board, and um, all the school boards over the years. I, I have voted for school board members. I, uh, participated in school district meetings, town meetings, and um, I was supportive of the board in 1998. I, was, uh, I voted in that vote uh, whether or not to separate from uh, SAU 30. I voted in favor of that, and I felt that if the system and the school board worked the way we want them to work. They did their job. I did not feel in any way betrayed that they decided to have a superintendent. I felt they were doing their job to, to act on behalf of the school district in the best interest of the school district. And <coughs> similarly, similarly in, uh, the, in 2011, when uh, we had that petition article, I actually voted for it because I supported the vote in 1998 to separate and I, I was pleased with the way the board proceeded from that vote and I affirmed that by voting affirmatively on the, the petition article in question. And um, Again, I feel the school board is acting appropriately to use their judgment in the best interest of the school district. And one more point, I think it was alluded to earlier, but I really, I respect um, the difference of opinion here. However, I feel that 
opinions about saving money, whether it's on the school budget or on the town budget, really more appropriately belong in budget committee hearings. And we are not at that point right now. I think um, that should come up during the budget process and not at this point. Thank you. Oh, and I do support having a superintendent for our schools. I, I am a teacher, and as I said, I've had three children go through the district, and there is just absolutely no substitute for a well-qualified superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Roger Bailey, to Aston Circle. I've had three children through the school district. One just graduated, one's just going to be moving into the high school. Um, running a school district is quite complicated, and as the last gentleman talked about the fact that uh, we hired you guys to do a job that we don't know all the details. There's no way this entire uh, population can know all the ins and outs of all the necessary changes that are going and are coming down as mandates. Uh, we look at you guys to do the job of understanding what we need to do. And whether you decide to use it as a superintendent or administrative thing, uh, I leave it up to you. If I don't like what you're doing, then I will try to vote you out at the appropriate time. But we hired you, we put in our faith in you to do the job correctly. And also, if you look at where the administrative work would go to, I don't know of a single principal that sits around and does much uh, playing cards, whatever. They tend to work long hours, hard hours, and they really put a lot of effort in to make sure they do a good job of administrating individual schools. And I don't think they have the extra bandwidth to try to take over the superintendent's responsibilities also. So keep up the good work. I support you. Thank you, sir. Hi. My name is Jean Lavin. I'll step away. I live on Stone Road in Guilford. Uh, I wanted to say just a couple of things. Um, first of all, I wanted to say it's, I understand Mr. Hemingway is a very nice man. Uh, I've heard that from people. I think what our issue is, is that um, as I listened to Sue Allen, she said uh, there were four people that you guys were looking at. One dropped out and one got another job, which left, left Mr. Hemingway and another person and which meant you had time to do that, to, to wait. You didn't have to hire them. Can I please finish? Okay. And what we're angry at is that you folks all knew that we were putting this warrant article on the ballot. And it felt just like it does when you ignore us in DC only on a real personal level. You ignored us. You hired the person a day before, which is not his fault. Um, and it feels very disrespectful. And, um, and then to see the words that came out in the newspaper, I'm sorry, Mr. Weber, but what you said about the voters was very unkind. And I just wanted you to know that we are getting really tired of being ignored and we are trying to save money, and it is a horrible economy. Thank you. If I can just make a correction. There were originally four finalists. Mm -hmm. One dropped out before the board started interviewing. The board interviewed three finalists, or not two, there were three. When we deliberated as to who we were offering the job,